Hello, and welcome to Inside the Alzheimer's Lab. I'm David Shank, author of The Forgetting and senior advisor to Cure Alzheimer's Fund, a not-for-profit scientific consortium dedicated to ending Alzheimer's as soon as possible. We bring you a series of discussions like this throughout the year to help you understand scientific research into Alzheimer's better. Today we're going to be having a really interesting discussion with Dr. Sam Sisodia about the relationship between Alzheimer's disease, the really largely hidden relationship, I should say, between Alzheimer's disease and the microbiome. The microbiome is all the microorganisms, I'm going to put this very crudely and Sam will fix it for me, but all the, all the microorganisms in your gut and how they are, act symbiotically uh, and live symbiotically with your, with your body and with your life. So let's say hello to Sam Sisodia. Uh, I'll do a little formal introduction first to kind of puff him up a little bit. Dr. Sangram S. Sisodia is Thomas, Thomas Reynolds Senior Family Professor of Neurosciences at, at the University of Chicago and Director of the Center for Molecular Neurobiology. And he's won basically every prize you can win in this field, but I'll mention a few. He's won the Potamkin Prize from the American Academy of Neurology. He's won the MetLife Award for Alzheimer's Research. He's a fellow at the National Academy of Sciences in India and at the National Academy of Sciences in Spain, and also a fellow at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. So that means he's very, very busy and important. So thank you for taking the time to thank you, David. talk with us today. Yeah. Tell us, before we get into your, your um, presentation that gets into the, some of the nitty gritty of, of the research you're doing, what is the microbiome and why should we, why, why are we, uh, why do we caring care? about it in re yeah. regards to Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, so the, um, so the microbiome basically encapsulates a, uh, a, a, another organ of the, of, the, of the body that we, until very recently, really didn't appreciate. It's the bacteria that um, are present in your gut and also actually on your skin. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's the gut bacteria that we're quite interested in. Um, it turns out there's three pounds of bacteria in the human gut. Wow. And I'm not talking about poop, I'm talking about real bugs. Right, right. And uh, if I compare it to the size of the brain, the human brain is only about two and two pounds and change. Wow. So there's a lot of bacteria in the gut and in fact uh, recent estimates are there are as many bacterial cells in a human body as there are total cells in a human body. So the question is how does the presence of this bacteria influence metabolism, which we know it does. We've known that for decades right. in various systemic processes, but now begin to realize that it might actually have an influence on, on brain function and physiology and now in disease. That was sort of this uh, investigation that we sort of ventured out on to look at the potential influence of the bacterial species and what's called the microbiome or the microbiota in influencing brain pathology. Right. And so this is a first of its kind study, is it not? This connection of, of the microbiome to Alzheimer's? In Alzheimer's disease, this is the first study of its sort. There have certainly been other examples using approaches that we've used and others have employed to ask the question if um, uh, alterations in the microbiome might contribute to or change the pathogenesis of other diseases, for mm -hmm. example, in MS or in, in, in Parkinson's disease, um, now beginning to sort of evolve into many other neurogenic diseases. I think right. that there's a beginning to be a, a, a larger uh, interest in this, in this area, especially in the area of autism spectrum disorders, mm. depression, psychiatric illnesses. Clearly there is a, especially in models, in again now rodent models, of these, these conditions where changing the microbiome can affect the clinical sort of features in these, in these diseases in these, in, these, in these models. Right. So is that where you got the idea to do a, a direct examination of how it affects Alzheimer's, that there were indications from other disease exactly. studies? Okay. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, well let's uh, dive into... Sorry, sorry. Sure. Yeah. Why don't you dive into what you're yeah. researching? Yeah. So that sort of se segues into uh, some of the slides that I want to... that I prepared. Um, and why we got into it. And as I mentioned, um, so Lloyd Casper at, at Dartmouth had 
done this fascinating study where he's interested in, in this mouse model of uh, MS um, and show that by changing the bacterial genome, bacterial composition um, in these animals, you could protect them against this debilitating condition that you find in these mouse models, which uh, hopefully will be uh, extended in, uh, into humans. Another study that was done by Constantino Adecola, who is also part of our our consortium, uh, a Cure Alzheimer's Fund, Constantino is interested in stroke and found that by changing uh, the bacterial species in the gut in these animals that are prone to um, stroke in a stroke-like model, that they were protective um, and has identified some factors that are involved in that. And then uh, very recently, um, I was really fascinated by a study that was done by a group in, a group in, in Freiburg, Germany, uh, Marco Prince and his colleagues, showing that by changing, changing the bacteria um, in the gut of, of, in mice, you can actually change the metabolism of cells in the brain. Cells mm. in the brain, which are called microglia, which are a very important component of brain clearance of bad stuff that builds up, uh, which we for many years have believed in the Alzheimer's field to be very important in, in aspects of Alzheimer's disease pathology uh, the in neuroinflammation, what's called neuroinflammation, and from work from Rudy Tanzi and and his and his group here, and in co collaboration with uh, many others here in in Boston, have shown that uh, many of the genes involved in late onset Alzheimer's disease are really uh, expressed in microglial cells. Mm. So it's something about microglial function or dysfunction right. uh, that then uh, predisposes you to late onset Alzheimer's disease. So so we said. Let's just do this experiment just for fun. Uh, it really <laughs> was, uh, and, and that's what Cure Alzheimer's Fund does for us, um, is allow you to take the risks yeah. um, and, um, and go into uncharted territory, which uh, I would never have ever imagined in my life uh, be working in gut bacteria right. and immunology and neuroimmunology, but now I'm, now I'm stuck in it. Was it obvious to you at that point to, once you decided, well, let's look into this, was it obvious which experiment to do or were there hard decisions to make then about how you start this? I, 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 the, it was not a hard experiment. It was, uh, the reason that I ventured into it was because, not only because of this prevailing evidence um, that there may be some effect of the gut bacteria on uh, psychiatric and maybe some of these disease models in, uh, in, in humans in, that have been recapitulated in mice, but that I had a very, very good close friend who was the head of the GI section in the Department of Medicine at University of Chicago, mm -hmm. named Gene Chang, and I said, Gene, I want to do this experiment. I don't know what's going what's to happen. You might, the pathology might get worse, it might get better. I'll take either one of those outcomes. Right. If it doesn't change, I'll move on. Right. And I said, how do we do this? He says, that sounds like, why don't we do it? Yeah. So I, I collaborated with this uh, phenomenal guy. Um, his name is Gene Chang. And, uh, and his postdocs, uh, together with my postdoc, his name is Miles Minter. Miles Minter. And um, so we went on this journey. Right. All right, let's hear, let's hear more about this yeah. journey then. So that's uh, basically what we did. And uh, so the... The slide uh, describes what we see in, the, uh, in a healthy brain in a cartoon-like fashion. These are cells, uh, these are neuronal cells, uh, the long axons and dendrites. These are uh, microglial cells and astrocytes, which normally live in the brain, which actually are as many astrocytes and microglial cells as there are neurons in the brain. Oh. Um, so they are playing very important roles in brain homeostasis. Um, but following an inflammatory stimulus, a beta, for example, uh, brain injury, et cetera, you, you get this inflamed brain. Right. And this inflamed brain means that these microglial cells start to get activated, astrocytes get activated. They, they're starting to degrade, or they want to degrade this, this A-beta plaques that build up in the brain. And, uh, um, but, you know, they're supposed to be taking care of the debris, but they also become activated and start sending out toxic molecules, which then in turn kill neurons. So this is this vicious cycle that we've sort of thought about for a long time. Uh, we poo-pooed it for, for many years till the genetics came around from identification of these genes involved in late onset disease, the work that came from Rudy Tanzi's lab, 
CD33, TREM2, et cetera, and we know that all these these genes are, in, are expressed in microglial cells. So something about microglial cells and the way they clear amyloid is an important it's, aspect. It's a, it's a healthy response. They, yes. They, they yes. do these important things, right. but somehow... But they, get, they, over, they, over, they, they overcompensate. Got it, okay. So let's, let's, let's do this experiment, which, was, which my, my buddy in uh, Chicago um, uh, suggested, and that's basically to treat mice with antibiotics, clean out their bacterial flora, and then say what, what happens to the pathology. So we treated mice long-term with a, a combination of antibiotics, a short-term treatment with very high-dose antibiotics in, in neonatal animals, which are basically two-week-old animals that are still being nursed mm -hmm. um, for one week, mm -hmm. a very high dose, and then we put them into a cage which has uh, uh, antibiotics at very low dose in the water. Mm -hmm till we sacrifice the animals. Mm -hmm. And we sacrifice these animals at different ages, females at five months of age, and males at six months of age, and I'll, we can discuss why we chose those ages to sacrifice the animals. And then we looked at the pathology, um, said, what happens? Mice, obviously different from humans, but are there, they have some of the same bacteria in their guts that we, that we have in our guts, or no, what's the? No, okay. they're really quite different. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the bacterial composition in human gut and rodent, uh, in, in the rodents who live in Chicago, in the University of Chicago, even at, at, at Northwestern are probably quite different. Okay. It's because what, it's what the, it's in their environment. Okay. Um, and where they came from originally. <laughs> um, one of the complications of doing this kind of work is that uh, the composition of bacteria can be hugely variable from right. laboratory to laboratory. Even within a laboratory, <laughs> right. um, uh, you cannot co-house animals that are treated with antibiotics or not because um, the animals will eat the poop of of another animal that has not been treated with antibiotics, and wow. so then they get the antibiotics, and then they get the different bacteria. Right. So there, there's a lot of controls that one has to do for these types of experiments. Yeah. That's because there's so many germs around, and uh, so controlling for this is, is 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 challenging, and and it varies from laboratory to laboratory, from university to university, etc. So, and and going back to the original point that you made, that there that the 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 mice are not only different from humans, but their the bacteria in their guts are going to be different from ours. Yeah, it's still it's still worth doing because there's some sort of relationship between their microbiome and their. Uh, well, I mean, I, you know, there uh, obviously there is this evidence that changes in the microbiome can be can have an influence on 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 brain physiology right. in in normal settings and in disease. Right. Okay. Models. Okay. Right. What those particular bacteria are and what they do and what they produce and what are the byproducts of the metabolism is still up in the air. Right. There's still a lot to be learned. This is early days. Uh, You're gonna raise more questions and we're than, gonna, right. than provide we're gonna, answers. We're, we're, right, we, we just need to open up this area because we think that there's an opportunity with this to provide us an, a result, whether positive or negative. Either way, it would've been interesting. Got it. Right. If there was no change, as I said, we would've moved on. So that was basically the experiment, and we um, and I'd love to discuss the issue about gender differences, sure. and, um, yeah, yeah. and we'll come back to that. So one of the the first surprise was okay, these are these are uh, antibiotic treated transgenic mice, and we looked at the total amount of bacterial species, the total amount of bacteria, the total bacterial load, both in the cecum and in the feces. So cecum is a is part of the gut. Okay, uh, cecum is just. Is a, is a part of the gut. And it turns out that there's actually no difference in the total amount of bacteria, even though they've been treated with antibiotics for this entire six months with antibiotics. Wow. So there's no change in the total amount of bacteria. So here's the controls, and these are antibiotic-treated animals. The total amount of bacteria is no different. Okay, well, that, that was a little bit of a surprise to me. I thought, well, you wipe out bacteria. Well, it turns out that it wasn't the amount of bacteria, it was the type of bacteria. Hmm. So that would that actually got changed. So this is the microbial composition. These are the these these colors basically assign uh, values to the types of bacteria that one finds in in the gut of these of these mice. Right. And we don't have to go to specifics, 
But following antibiotic treatment, what, what you find is that there's reduction in certain types of bacteria, expansion in other types of bacteria, and repopulation of different types of bacteria. Wow. So other bacteria take advantage, take advantage when, when right. another bacteria right. is getting killed. killed. Yeah. So when you wipe out some bacteria, the other ones go, oh, well, I have an opportunity. I start expand because they live in communities, right? Right. Just like the forest out there. It's one, like one animal some gets animal, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some animals are stronger than others. They control the environment, and they control the environment. Once you get rid of these guys, these guys flourish. So this is what now we can go and say, and, and which is what we're doing now, is what are these new bacteria? For example, these orange bacteria, let's call them. Okay. What are they producing? Yeah. What are they making? And... Are they helping or not helping? Or why is this reduction in this, in this light green bacteria, is that influencing some way in some metabolic state? Right, right. But the bottom line is, what happens is in these animals, if you look in male animals, these are, this is the total levels of, so this is just a, this is a section of a brain stained with an antibody that's specific for a beta, the amyloid peptide that builds up in plaques and plaques look like this. At a high, high power magnification, the plaques look like this. They're okay. loaded with amyloid, and you've seen plenty of these pictures before. You treat these animals with antibiotics, and the, there's many fewer plaques, and the plaques are much smaller and wow. much more compact. So you, quanti you can quantify this by various morphological methods, and you find that there's a significant reduction in the total level of, ant of these plaques in the brains of these animals that are treated with the antibiotics, and the size of these plaques is smaller. Every single one. Wow. So there's a real difference, and yeah. it's a significant difference. It's, you know, we're not talking about a 5 to 10 to 20 percent difference. This is about a 50 to 60 percent reduction wow. in total levels of amyloid plaques. Then in collaboration with Rudy, which is one of our important collaborations that we have by, with Cure Alzheimer's Fund, and it's really important because it was Cure Alzheimer's Fund that was supported this work. Right. Um, because we could have not gone to a federal agency and said, we want to do this experiment because we want to try it out. Yeah. Um, this is just basically proof of concept. Right. Try it out. Win or lose. It, 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 there, there's nothing to lose. Right. Right? This, let's just go for it. And so then with, in, in with Rudy um, here in Boston and, and Martin uh, Zhang in his lab, uh, we did uh, analysis of levels of A-beta peptides which in the brains of these animals, so basically a biochemical um, construct which reflects what we see morphologically, and you see that there's a reduction in the levels of A-beta peptides in these plaques. Unfortunately, um, it doesn't hold so true for female mice. Wow. So this is to remind you what we see in male mice. There's a reduction in plaque burden. Yep. In females, it looks like there's a trend, but it never reaches significance. I mean, statistical significance. You mean you, it does lo seem to lower a little bit, but It nothing? lowers, yeah, but not to um, some place where you can actually do the statistics and say, yes, there's a, a clear reduction. And, and you know, statistics is based on the number of animals, the number of times that you do this experiment. We do this experiment more and more times, and we get many more animals, and it still kind of looks like this. It's always just a trend, but never, it never hits that, that's, that biological significance. It may be real, but in our vernacular, it's not significant. When you showed me before that the, um, the pumping all those antibiotics in changed the makeup of the bacteria, yeah. uh, was that different from male to female? Very or? similar changes in bacteria. Okay. So that's not explaining the differences no, we're but, here. But, okay. there, but we have some clues, which okay. uh, maybe I'll be able to get to it or right, discuss sure. it, certainly, uh, as these slides go on. But there's some influence of... Um, of these bacterial species in male and female mice in terms of their innate immune response. So when we think about what microglial cells do, so microglial cells are your scavenger cells in the brain, um, peripher like peripheral macrophages. Mm -hmm. They're involved in clearing debris, they're activated by pathogens or debris and you know, things that come in. Right. So that's what microglial cells are, that's what, that's what their job is. And it's called the innate immune response. 
There's also what's called adaptive uh, innate response, which involves T cells and antigen recognition and all those kind of things. Yeah. This is a little bit different. This is something that's prehistoric. This is happens in right. this happens in 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 worms and flies. <laughs> right. Okay. Where they don't have an immunological kind of system that we have. Right. Right. Um, so this is like the earliest pathogenic. So these are bugs, right? And and how they influence the peripheral immune system. Right. And so there is an interaction between our genetics and our immune system, our innate immune system, and those genes which I described for you, CD33, TREM2, et cetera, are all innate, involved in innate immunity. And they're all expressed right. in microglial cells. Just to, just to pause there for one second, yeah. so, and we've, I, we've touched on this in so many different ways with other research, but um, you're saying in both in mice and in, in human beings and a lot of other animals, there's essentially, humans have two different immune systems. Yes. Um, we have the immune system that we've, that we grew up learning about with the with the, the white blood cells and yeah, something yeah. you get a cut in your finger yeah, this right. thing right here and yeah, there's yeah. and there's that whole kind of white blood cell immune yes. system to kind of put it that yeah. way and then there's what you were calling the innate immune yeah, response the natural immunity which is not connected to the white blood cells not, right? right it's much right. more as you said primitive it's older primitive than that. primitive and we actually both of those immune yeah. systems are operating yeah. in our bodies. So yeah. we have the primitive part, we also have the more advanced part. That's correct. And I just wanted to kind of... That's correct. All right, go That's ahead. That's correct. And so the question is, why is there the difference between males and female um, animals? And we know that the bacterial species do change in a significant way, as, as we have shown in the male mice, but they don't have the same response. Now again, you know, I have to, I have to say that this is or correlative, right? There's no mechanism here. This is, we, there's something that happens in the brain and there's something that happens in the periphery in terms of the bacterial species yeah. changing. And we can see that there's also different proteins that are changing in the plasma of these animals that are treated with, with, that, with antibiotics, which I'll come to in, a, in the next couple of slides. Right. But it's all correlations. We don't know what the, you don't know we, what's we, causing don't, what? we, don't, we don't know what the, what the, you know, what the magic uh, connection is, right. which is what we're after now. So it could be that the, the antibiotics are causing something else to change, which are causing something, something else, else to change. To change something else to change. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. there could be set five steps in right. between. Okay. But one thing we notice is that these cells, which I've spoken to you about, microglial cells, which are the, the native macrophages in the brain, we actually see less of them in the brain. You think, oh, why would that be, right? Well, it, this is a picture in time, right? This is a, this is a static image. This is not something that we don't know what happened yesterday or a week before or a month ago. This is a static image of the time when we cull the animals. The plaques are obviously smaller and there's fewer microglial cells, mm. okay? So you think, well, so wait a minute, you, you just told me that microglial cells get activated and they should be chewing up the amyloid, that's what they're yeah. supposed to do, but why are they less? Well, I'd say maybe they're just chewing up much faster than normal and you know, a week or two, week ago, two weeks ago, there were a lot more cells there that were highly activated and we're just looking at something that happened towards the end of the process. I see. We don't, we don't know. So one of the experiments that we need to do now is to look by real-time imaging, which is Ooh. a possible thing to do. We basically make a cranial window in the brain and many people in the consortium have these approaches already in their laboratories. And you can and label these cells with specific fluorescent markers, right. and then actually watch this happen in time, over a long, wow. longitudinally. And we can do these kind of experiments. We, we, don't, we don't have that opportunity to do it right now, yeah. but it's something that we want to do. Okay. And it's uh, probably another collaboration that we will build within the within Cure Alzheimer's Fund to look at what happens over time. Right. You know, starting at, let's say, two or three or four months of age, till the age of six months of age yep. when we cull these animals. Okay. To see what is the effect of these plaques growing, diminishing, how do the microglial cells get activated, how do they see this? And so that might explain what we see here. So we see less of these cells, but what we know is that when we look at these cells up close, they're in a highly activated state. So these cells, so this is now in a high resolution, kind of a same picture that I showed you earlier taking this and now blowing it up yeah. and doing a sort of a different sort of morphological analysis. This is the plaque, these are the microglial cells. This is a smaller plaque, you know which, when we have antibody treated, the, the plaques are smaller. 
there's fewer cells, but you can see they're much more branched. Mm. They're much more elaborated, right? which means they're highly active, in a highly activated state. They are sensing some debris, and they are going after this in a big way. Right. So their objective is, is basically to clear the stuff. Mm -hmm. So we can go back in time okay. and say, well, what they were doing, or what they have been doing for all this, for the last few months, is that they've been chewing on this stuff really fast. But they stay in this activated state. Again, a correlation, right? So we have the bugs are changing over there. We don't think that these, these antibiotics are getting into the brain and changing the microglial cells. That's not happening. Right. But there's something we think are metabolites from the periphery that are generated by the bacteria or by peripheral systems that are inf infecting the biology of these microglial cells that are changing their way to, to basically what's called phagocytose, so eat up, can eat you, the plaques. Can you explain metabolites from the periphery, what, what that means? Right, so, you know, so you know, you eat whatever you eat. Is, Peanut is butter broken sandwich. Yeah. It's broken down by bacteria. Okay. Right? And bacteria, uh, depending if you eat a high-fat diet or a low-fat diet, yeah. you eat red meat versus fish or, or yeah. not, you produce small molecules. Yeah. Right? Those are metabolites. Meta the, the, those the, are metabolites. Okay. Small right. molecules. Got it. Got right? It. Okay. Which then get in the bloodstream that are taken up by cells and in different tissues that are important for 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 their sustenance. Okay. Right. That's and so and we know that some of those metabolites, for example, short chain fatty acids, and you've heard about those that can probably get in the brain and are known to activate microglial cells. Is that what's happening here? We don't know. That is one of the next uh, uh, launch paths in our, in, our, in, our, in our investigations is identifying these metabolites that are important for driving this phenomenon. That's, just, we're trying just, to find the connection. By the way, you just scared me into eating better. Yeah, <laughs> just got to eat better. That, that's, you know, eating better. I know that's not our subject really, yeah, but, but it it's, is it's about connected eating, to that. Okay. It is about better. It is about eating better. You just made a connection that I couldn't it really is about visualize eating before. Because the metabol... All right, all right. It's metabolites. Yeah, all right. Yeah. So, what could be the changes that occur in, in the brains of these animals, or that could be influenced by, by, by the periphery? So, we basically took the plasma or serum from these animals that are controlled or antibody treated, and we asked what are the type of molecules that are present in the plasma of these animals after treatment, and we find that there are a number of these, what are called serum inflammatory mediators. So, a number of molecules which we know quite a bit about the biology. We know quite a bit about how they regulate peripheral metabolism. We know how they affect peripheral inf inflammation. Mm -hmm. But we also now don't, actually don't know how they influence central metabolism. This is all looking at plasma cytokines. These are plasma mole molecules in the plasma in animals that are treated with antibiotics or not. And we see significant changes. Many of these are factors that we are now following up and saying, are these really affecting the biology of microglial cells? Do they get across the blood-brain barrier? This one we know gets across the blood-brain barrier, and it's like the, one of the highest molecules that has changed in these animals that are treated with antibiotics. And we know that it, it affects the metabolism or the morphology and the function of microglial cells. They become more phagocytic when they're treated with something like CCL11. So maybe that's the connection. Right. We don't know, right? So we have to do this in genetic experiments. So we have genetic experiments going where we cross these animals, cross our animals from mice that lack CCL11. Say, is that an important factor? Is that the one that's actually influencing the brain, the changes in, in, brain, uh, in, in brain amyloid levels? I've lost track of new experiments that you need to do. Oh, now. yeah, it's, right. These are early dozens? Days. These are early days, right? Right. I mean, we have, you know, look at the number of knockouts we need to make. Or, or new SI, or, you know, new technologies that we can use right. that are available now in, in present day, in the present day, that we can knock these genes out very rapidly. We can do this even that does require years and months and years. Meaning, change the genetics of change the mice. Change genetics of the mice, and then look right. at right. right. Okay. So and say which are the ones that are really important for this. I know this is kind of a sidelight, but you were talking earlier about how this is a kind of a proof of concept thing, this first right. experiment. How many of the new experiments that you're talking about, and it sounds like dozens of them, yeah. 
but how many of those are also going to have to be funded at a kind of an experimental proof of concept level like by, by a group like Cure Alzheimer's Fund versus how many do you think we can get money straight from the NIH or are at that level where the NIH would be interested I, I, in I think the NIH is very interested in it. Okay. I mean, I think that this is, so this is gonna get kind of, the, this is sort of groundbreaking stuff. Right. And, and I've seen now a couple of RFAs uh, request for fund for for, for um, funding from um, from the NIH to look at issues like this, right? Environmental factors and how they influence uh, uh, pathologies that associate with Alzheimer's disease, whether it's amyloid pathology or tau pathology or both. Uh, in the in you know in experimental models, right? You know, not not going to humans, but really looking. Uh, at, a, at a molecular level in these experimental models. And they are very, very interested in this because this is totally new territory. It opens up a, a, a completely different, a, a new interesting area that blends um, areas which we never really thought about very much before and kind of poo-pooed it and that's just in, in, interested in, in immunity, you know, right? right? innate and then adaptive immunity right. and uh, ultimately in how that influences uh, central metabolism and plaque deposition, ultimately cognitive deficits, et cetera. So that was an experiment where we treat animals for six months with antibiotics. So the very short-term treatment for one week with a high dose of antibiotics when these animals were pups mm -hmm. and then had a low dose of antibiotic in the water till we sacrificed them at six months of age. Mm -hmm. We did another experiment, which is now in review, which is, came as a huge surprise. And so there's basically the idea that postnatal development is a time frame when the commensal microbiome, that's the bugs in the guts, uh, are susceptible to uh, prolonged perturbation, represents a crucial window in which the microbiome and the host mediate immuno and neurodevelopment that may impact on host physiology. So that's been known since 2009. What's the perturbation, I'm sorry? Changes. Okay, all right. By affecting the microbiome very early in life, you can have a huge impact later in life. Autism spectrum disorders, for example. Right. Depression, schizophrenia. In, in again, in models. These right. are in mouse models. Right. So basically what we did, treat these two-week-old animals with uh, one-week dose of a high concentration of antibiotics, just for one week, put them in a cage, regular water, now sacrifice them at six months of age. Again, what you see here is one week, one week gavage treated animals. You can see significant changes in the mic mic gut microbiome. This is now six months later. Mm -hmm. This is to compare to comparison to what I showed you earlier, where we showed big differences in the bacterial genomes um, in the animals that were treated long term. Mm -hmm. But you know there are you know, fairly significant reductions and changes and in, in elevations in, in bacterial species. But the most important result is the following, is that the plaque burden in these animals was reduced by 50%. As opposed to what kind of reduction in that earlier experiment? Same. Hardly indistinguishable in terms of the level of plaque reduction for long-term treatment over a one-week treatment with antibiotics very early in life. Wow. Was that a surprise to you? Huge surprise. You thought that it would be, this would be the, less right, of a difference? Are recompens yeah. yeah. There'll be a recompensation, bacterial will the, the ones that they will fight back, they will regain their, their right. territories, they will, right. right. But, but we saw this, this change again, and very similarly, see a very de similar decrease in the levels of these uh, microglial cells, right. very much as we've seen before. They have the same sort of morphological characteristics as we was all shown in this, in, in this assessment uh, of the, of the of the, of the morphology of these microglial, which look like they are really going to town when they see this damage or this pathology. Hmm. But you set it up early on in life. Right. So are, are we now talking about, I mean, I know that it's a zillion steps between here and there, yeah. but are we now talking about the concept of eventually uh, some sort of drug that might be given to humans, not at, at age 35 or 40, but at age in utero or something where it's like yeah. it's well I, protective uh, in some strange way uh, yeah. for so the they, end of life so you know if we can identify the types of molecules that are produced by bacteria or by the host right because the bacteria are 
back, it host, it's a host bacteria in, 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 in interaction, right? Right. So the host is also producing stuff that goes into the plasma. Right. And then at some, at some level it might go into the brain and affect brain function. If we can identify those type of molecules, they could be a new way of thinking about changing host metabolism, changing the function of those microglial cells right. to get them to chew up more of the bad stuff that builds up. Right? The, the, Ultimately, that would be the ultimate goal. Right. And the type of effects you're seeing just in these early experiments, that could make the difference between, I know that this is again, extrapolating or you know, a yeah. lot of, lot of uh, barriers to jump across here, but you're talking about a big enough difference that it could end up making the difference between Alzheimer's, getting Alzheimer's at all, oh, or getting it years and years, years later. later. Yeah. So we're Absolutely. talking about potentially huge differences if, huge. if this translates. We, you know, we've, we really haven't, for the last, uh, until very recently, uh, appreciated the importance of what goes down, what's, what goes on south of, south, south of the neck yeah. uh, on, on brain function. And I think we've, we're having great appreciation of it. So uh, I think this is a good point. Again, correlative. Yes. Not causal, necessarily. But not causal. Yeah. So this is a good moment to say to people, ever, we're, we're all thinking right now what I'm thinking, which is, okay, what kind of yogurt should I be eating? Right. <laughs> what kind of antibiotics should I be taking or giving my kid or whatever? And there's really nothing, nothing. to be done from this nothing. because there are way too many questions. You could be doing exactly the wrong thing, right? If, nothing if you, at all. Yeah, okay. Nothing at all. Um, and yeah, so, you know, we don't know. You haven't changed your diet because of... Because my diet hasn't changed one bit. <laughs> But, you know, the, the question, so is there any epidemiology of people who have taken long-term antibiotics right. and, and their risk for Alzheimer's disease? None. Oh, because that's been it, studied. It has been studied, but there's really very little epidemiological data that has, okay. has emerged okay. to support that particular concept. People don't take antibiotics long-term. Right. You know, unless you, so well, they also the only don't example... Yeah, the only example that I know of are people who have kidney stones who, who are not debilitated by de t kidney stones, but they take medicines for kidney stones because people who have kidney stones also have adventitious uh, infections, bacterial right. infections. And so they can be on long-term antibiotic treatment for maybe even 10 to 15 years. Yeah. Have those been people been followed up? I don't know, but I know they exist. <laughs> and it's something that one, one can go and look at, it's, what about? You know, we take antibiotics, well, for a very short period of time. And maybe that's enough to change your biome. Yeah. What about the, what about in, the in utero stuff, getting data from Well, but it, because they also come from, yeah. So that, so, so, so antibiotics uh, certainly does cross the blood-brain barrier and can affect the, 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 you know, can, can affect the biology and embryos. How that's gonna influence things, who knows? Should we be digging up data of mothers who had an, a certain antibiotics at certain periods when they were pregnant? Yeah, but look, we're all different, right? We're all, we all have, every single person in this room have different bacterial genomes. Yeah. A different composition of bacterial genomes, just like these mice. I'm, I'm sure that the mice in Chicago, University of Chicago and mice in Northwestern probably have very different composition of bacteria. They may have similar types of bacteria, but the composition could, could be very different. Some are, very, are much stronger, much, are, are, are much more at higher levels in proportion, and, and also in different back, genetic backgrounds, right? So it's, there's an influence of genetics of the host, genetics of the bacteria, and that interaction. Yeah. It's very different, right? And as humans, we're completely different. Well, that's why it sounds to me like, I mean, as interesting as this is, it sounds to me like you're opening up so many questions and so much complexity that you're never going to be able to come up with useful applications of this. But Not anytime soon. <laughs> right. <laughs> not anytime soon. This is not research that gives us a, a drug in two years. It's not going to give you a drug in two years. Yeah. No. And, you know, as interesting is the issue of, of uh, which I touched on, is the difference between males and females. Right. Right? Uh, what is that about? One thing I can tell you is that um, I just heard a, uh, a lecture from Richard Ranserhoff, who's now at, um, at, at Biogen. Uh, he's probably one of the premier 
uh, neuroimmunologists in in the world. Mm -hmm. It was a Cleveland clinic, and and I just heard him give a lecture and sh say, and and he, and he talked about that if you if you purify microglia from brains of male mice versus female mice, they have very different signatures, uh, transcriptional signatures, that they express different types of proteins at different levels. Don't know why, but there may be something different in the way that female uh, animals respond to, to uh, this debris, as do male animals. Right. And we know women are at higher risk for Alzheimer's disease. Right. N we never understood that. Maybe the microglial cells don't work as well. I don't know. It's just you know, it's just a theory. It's just, it's just you know, you can just so there's a lot more experiments. Wave your hands all over the way, but, but we can do this. So we can then transplant. We can do transplants, right? Male mice, male serum into female mice, etc. Right. You know, we can take male feces, feces from male mice, put in female mice. See if you can change the change the pathology if it's the bug, if it's the bugs itself right right so so these are these fecal transplant type experiments yep. that people right. have, have been talked about talking about for for quite some time they're dual in in these in these simple models will they be translatable to humans open question um, and it wasn't too long ago that they that not much research if any was being done on female mice at all right didn't we used to just use male mice because it was more convenient? Or tell, tell me about that. No. Uh, okay. So a lot of people use female. So it's, it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's, it's a mixed bag. OK. Um, the reason we use male mice and have used male mice for the last couple of decades, and most people do, is that female mice have very different social behaviors. Mm -hmm. So one of the advantages of, 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 using, of, of working with female mice is you can put a lot of female mice in a, in a cage. You can't do that with male mice. Mm. Male mice, they have to be from the same litter, and they, and they can live in a cage. But you can mix litters from multiple, cage, from mil from multiple litters. Uh -huh. They'll kill each other. They go after each other. Wow. Female mice, you can put dozens in a cage from multiple litters from different yep. moms. Yep. It doesn't matter. That means they sound, sound so like it's cheaper, they're right? easy. They're so easier. It's cheap, so yeah. it's cheap, right? Okay. It saves you on, on your per diem costs and your mouse housing costs. Yep. What happens under those conditions, however, is that they have these weird social behaviors. It's called dominance hierarchy. There's always like the dominant female, and you and she's generally the older one, and then there's all these, and then the younger ones right. become heavily. They they are really they're depressed. Hmm. They they actually show anxiety behaviors. They have very very different sort of behavioral characteristics, which are. Which are which are not good, mm -hmm. and you can measure the levels of specific types of hormones that that tell you that they are depressed or they or they have psychiatric psychological uh, issues um, uh, that they are in in a condition where they're they're not happy, right? Okay, because they're in a in a depressive condition, right? In fact, if you take a female mice, uh, one of the older female mice from these larger co groups of female animals, they're generally, they're, they don't have any hair left because they're all groomed. They're continually groomed. Hmm. This is part of their behavior. So that's, that social behavior uh, has a huge <laughs> impact, especially if we look at a brain function. Right, right. And that's why people don't work on female mice. Why can't you just house them the same way you house the males? Not, not let them. No, that's what I'm saying. Them. Female mice you can bring from multiple, from yeah. multiple moms. Right, right. Put them in a large cage, right? Yeah. And you can house as many females. No problem. Saves them in cage costs and everything else. But then they have all this, they have all this, this behavioral features which are chemical. Yeah. Male mice you you can't put males two mice from from multiple mothers together in the same cage. They, they go after each other. They kill each other. Yeah. So, so you work on male mice because they are independent. <laughs> it's just they're very controlled. Right. So that's in in terms of their setting, they eat the same food, they drink the same amount of water, yeah. all that kind of thing. Female mice, there's no control. And that's why female mice are not used for many sort of behavioral experiments and for experiments, the, the type of things that we do. 
So tell me, you know, just choose something you want to do next. There's, yeah. there's, there's dozens of possibilities, yeah. but what, what are you thinking about? So one of the, one of the experiments that's, uh, that's ongoing um, is, um, is that we're generating mice which don't have any bugs at all. Hmm. Um, and they're you being mean genetically? You're doing no, that? Oh, no, no they will be they will be born without bacteria. How do you pull that off? Uh, we uh, because of this uh, collaboration that we have with Taconic. Okay. They are they're building these mice um, for us, which um, and using approaches which have been used for for decades, where mm -hmm. uh, mice are basically born without any bugs. Um, now we don't know what's going to happen in those in those mice in terms of their their normal levels of of amyloid deposition because now they don't have a mature immune system because right. as, as, as I mentioned in one of my slides that the the immune system develops very very early on in life but is also dependent on on your microbes right it's that's how your right. immune system gets going um, so now they have a very immature immune system I mean it's primed to go but it's not but it's not primed like our our embryos or right. or uh, or when we were when we were at a, at a point when we were actually going to have some bacteria in 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 our system which mm -hmm. would be very late in in embryogenesis and in in uh, uh, immediately after birth um, so they have a sort of an immune uh, an immature immune system and we don't know how that is going to contribute to something that happens in the brain in terms of the pathology that we would expect if we do see some change in pathology in those animals, as we would expect that they do, because they don't have an immune system, they don't have an, you know, they've never seen bacteria, right? Mm -hmm. We can now reintroduce those bacteria that we identified in the first set of experiments, reintroduce those and say, how can you now affect, modify, mm. up or down, and then say, what is it about those bacteria that are changing it? And what are, what are they producing? What are their metabolites? How are they affecting peripheral metabolism, making other, you know, affecting other cells in the periphery to secrete factors that might possibly get into the blood brain, cross the blood brain barrier that can affect microglial function or function of other cells in the brain, maybe just neurons themselves. So those are the, that's one set of experiments that are, that are ongoing. And the other set of experiments is really to say, what is going on with the microglia? What you know? What are they responding to? What are these right. What are these cells seeing? And when there's when they've been when you've had antibiotic treatment and they're affecting the the bugs and how are the microglia responding to the change right. in the periphery? Are they? How, how can you activate these microglia? If you can activate the microglia in some way, with some small molecules, so that they're phagocytic but not degenerative. So they're not causing the havoc that you right, see in, right. the, in the inflamed brain, but they actually are doing something really good and like right. really chewing the stuff up. They're doing the good stuff, not doing the bad the good stuff. stuff yeah. not the bad stuff. Yeah. We're golden. Um, so are you going to be microbiome guy for the rest of your I, no. scientific career? No. I, I mean, this is a part of, part of my lab. Yeah. You know, I have several people working on, on this aspect. I have several other projects going on in the lab, which are really unrelated yeah but they might come back yeah. to all be part of it you'll see you know, connections they might they, they might be yeah so for example I'm I'm interested in um, something I've been interested in for the last uh, 10 years or so is the the birth of new neurons in the brain mm. um, um, a process called neurogenesis and right. it happens in the hippocampus primarily and also in another part of the brain but uh, a part of the brain that's important in memory formation and and um, now there's evidence that the microbiome does play a role in ways that we don't understand in, in the birth of new neurons and their survival in the, in the hippocampus. Wow. And it turns out uh, that it's likely due to microglia, microglial cells in that in microenvironment that are regulating the birth and death of those cells. You got it from these experiments or you got it, it, that from independently. somewhere else? Wow. Totally independently. Wow. Yeah. So there's <laughs> bugs are bug yeah. Bugs bugs are pretty cool. That's amazing. Yeah. That they can affect 
And so when we talk about pathology as one, one sort of signature of the disease, and you talk about, about memory and short-term memory loss, short-term memory is created in the hippocampus, and these, these, these newly born cells in the, in the region of the hippocampus called the dentate gyrus are, are responsible for making new memory. Yeah. Yeah, well, maybe some things, all, they're all kind of tied together. Wow. Uh, <laughs> that's about all the time we have for our program today. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions about the science in today's program, please post them on Facebook, on our Facebook page, at facebook.com slash curealzheimers. Also, please join us for our annual research symposium on October 19th of this year at the beautiful Boston Public Library. Our featured speakers will be Dr. Rudy Tanzi and Dr. Rob Moyer from Harvard and Massachusetts General Hospital, and Dr. Sam Gandhi from Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. Attendance is free, but it does require pre-registration at our website. That's CureAlls, Cure, A-L-Z, slash symposium. If you can't make it in person, you can always watch it live on our website. And if you haven't been to our symposium in person or seen it live, take my word for it. It's fascinating. It's, it's, it's well worth your time. So please put that on your calendar October 19th. Inside the Alzheimer's Lab is a production of Cure Alzheimer's Fund, a not-for-profit dedicated to supporting the research that will stop this terrible disease. Every dollar you donate to Cure Alzheimer's Fund goes directly to scientific research. That's because our board of directors covers all administrative costs, all the staff salaries, the rent for offices, all that stuff is covered by our board so that every penny, literally, that you donate will go straight to a lab like Dr. Sisodia's here. So a special appreciation and thanks to that board, co-chairman Jeff Morby and Henry McCants, and directors Jackie Morby, Phyllis Rappaport, Robert Greenhill, Sherry Sharp, and our fearless CEO, Tim Armour. And thanks again to our special guest, Dr. Sam Sisodia, for this amazing, fascinating discussion. I'm David Shank. Thank you for watching.